We're back here on the Urology Care Podcast. We're at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill on the medical campus. I have a very special guest today. I'm going to let him introduce himself now. Hello, my name is Davis Rupert Cassett, and I'm a urologist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I have a special interest in the treatment of benign prostatic diseases, and today I'll be discussing the disease benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. What causes it? That's a great question. Unfortunately, we don't really know what's the exact cause of BPH. We know that for most men, BPH is a normal condition as every guy gets older. Um, it probably has to do with changes in, in balance of male hormones or androgens and the environment uh, as men get older. How do you know if you have it? So most men will present with symptoms uh, that cause them bother which leads them to the diagnosis of BPH. You know, BPH is a diagnosis of enlargement of the prostate that's not due to cancer and can progressively cause more bothersome urinary symptoms. Usually men will complain of, you know, going to the bathroom more frequently, having the urge to urinate more often, maybe getting up at night a couple more times uh, than they're used to. When they do go to the bathroom during the day, they may have to strain Mm -hmm. or the urination is a start and stop and just really causes them different symptoms than they were having maybe when they were in their 20s, and that leads them to this diagnosis. Is there a rough estimate uh, or number of how many men have this condition? Well, you know, as most men, probably if they live long enough, will have some enlargement of the prostate. Probably every guy within their lifetime will have some symptoms of BPH. We know that symptomatic BPH probably doesn't bother men in their 40s, but when we look at men in their 50s or 60s, probably a third of men will have some bothersome, moderate, or severe symptoms. Mm-hmm. And definitely by the age of 60, maybe 50% of men will have bothersome symptoms. Um, and you said that BPH is clearly, it's a, it's a benign non-cancer. Is there similar symptoms to um, BPH that, that there is to prostate cancer? Definitely. I mean, I think a lot of patients, when they first come to see me to talk about BPH, Probably in the back of their mind, they're worried about, could this be prostate cancer? Both of these diseases do affect the prostate. Um, We know that prostate cancer is a cancerous or uncontrolled growth of prostate cells um, that can spread outside of the body, and that's different than BPH, which is contained to the prostate. Um, You know, most of the time, men with prostate cancer, we're diagnosing that based on either an abnormal physical exam of the prostate or an abnormal laboratory test of the PSA or prostate blood level. And that's probably different than BPH. There are some men that will have urinary symptoms when they have more severe prostate cancer, but that's usually really late in the disease. Okay. Can you tell me about prostatitis? Is, is that similar to BPH? Is that completely different? What is, what is that? Sure. So prostatitis is probably the third you know, disease that we think of behind BPH and prostate cancer related to the prostate. Uh-huh. Instead of just an enlargement of the prostate, which is what BPH is, you know, prostatitis is a non-cancerous condition, but it's inflammation of the prostate. And BPH typically affects men as they get older. Prostatitis can affect men of all different ages. And so usually prostatitis is due to some sort of inciting, irritating event that causes inflammation of the prostate. Most commonly, it's due to a bacterial infection. Sometimes it's due to other things. And they both can cause bothersome urinary symptoms. But with prostatitis, it's more commonly uh, frequency of urination, needing to go to the bathroom more often, maybe pain when you urinate or blood in the urinate, uh, blood in the urine, which is different than BPH urine symptoms. Also, many of the guys, when they have prostatitis, will also complain of uh, pain, pain in their pelvic region, pain in their lower back region, pain in their rectum, and they may have fevers, they may have chills, they have other symptoms of just really not feeling very well. And we don't typically see that with patients with BPH. Uh, Prostatitis is something that you may have for a short time that gets treated and gets better, or it could last for months and months, or it could keep coming back. And so it can also be a pretty devastating disease. What's a BPH urine symptom feel like? How would you describe that? Sure, I think many men will have sort of a range in urine symptoms that's different what they had when they were younger. So during the day, they're feeling like they're going more often than they need to. They're feeling the urge to urinate more often than they need to. They tell me when they're at a ball game or they're at a movie, they really can't sit through them 
sit through it anymore where they used to be able to. Mm-hmm. They may tell me that, you know, gosh, I'm getting up more frequently at night to urinate. And when I do go, it takes me a while to get started. I have to push or strain a little bit. Sometimes the urine where it used to be super strong and straight is now sort of start and stop. Yeah. And I feel like either I'm, I'm maybe leaking a little bit or, gosh, I'm not emptying all the way. And it's starting to become more bothersome. So would it, is it more than just frequent urination? Like, would you know it's BPH versus I'm drinking a, too much water at, you know, or I'm drinking excessive liquids or something? That's a great question. I mean, I think definitely there are behavioral things that can cause you to urinate more. And those are some of the things when we talk about treatment that we try to address. If you drink more fluids, definitely you may need to urinate more often. But this is men that even if I'm not drinking that much, I feel like I'm going more often that maybe if I drink more, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. But even at baseline, even if I try to back off a little bit on my fluids, I'm still getting up more often or going more often during the day, more than I'm used to. And that's uh, a bother. And how is BPH treated? There are sort of different levels of BPH treatment depending on how severe your symptoms are. I think first steps, we would definitely do some lifestyle or behavioral changes. So typically, based on our history of the patient and we do a physical exam, if we get a sense of how much bother some of their symptoms are, I might recommend you you do what's called timed voiding. So instead of waiting to urinate when you feel like you really, really need to go and maybe that's too late, maybe using a clock to say, you know, every two, maybe every three hours, maybe I'll try to go to the bathroom and see if I can stimulate or try to empty my bladder. Recognizing that some men with BPH may not empty all the way, so after they do try to urinate, maybe try to go again. See if you can get a little bit more out. That's called double voiding, and you'll be surprised. Maybe the second time you do empty a little bit more. As we mentioned earlier, if it is related to your fluids, maybe shifting your fluids during the day earlier, if you worry about getting up a lot in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. We know that with aging, we know that uh, you have an increased production of urine or you make more urine just by you know getting older and going to sleep. So maybe shifting the fluids earlier in the day may help you get up a little bit less at night. There are definitely some fluids like alcohol or soda or coffee, which make you produce more urine. So maybe trying to back off on some of those fluids would help. There are other things as well as, you know, if you're having to strain because you have a lot of troubles with bowel movements or constipation, that can affect how well you feel like you can urinate. You know, we know that being overweight or, you know, obese or not being super physically active can sometimes affect urination. So I often will recommend, you know, increased physical activity, weight loss, uh, sort of a nice healthy lifestyle because that will help your urinary symptoms as well. If we do those behavioral things and lifestyle and, and the patient's symptoms aren't better or mm. their symptoms are worse, really the next step and sort of a mainstay in treatment is medication therapy. And there's a host of different medicines that we often will prescribe depending on what your symptoms are. Sure. You know, the most common medication that we often will give is something what's called an alpha blocker. And that will help uh, the prostate and the bladder sort of relax so that you can uh, squeeze the urine out uh, sort of say, say a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, you know, a different medicine for men who have really, really large prostates, we may give them what's called a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which is a medicine that really slowly over time will hopefully help shrink the prostate, or which hopefully would improve symptoms. I have some men that not only have BPH symptoms, but will have bothersome erectile dysfunction troubles. And for those men, we often will give them what's called a phosphodiesterase inhibitor medication, which may be able to help both of those issues. And when we have some men who have really, you know, not only prostate issues, but really bothersome bladder issues, they're very overactive bladder, they're having to go so, so often, sometimes we give them medications called anticholinergics or beta-3 agonist medications, which may help relax the bladder so it doesn't feel like it's so sensitive and it is squeezed so often. Those are sort of the most common medicines that I'll give. I have a lot of guys that will present to my clinic that also take uh, complementary and alternative medications for BPH. There's a lot of medications that are out there that are marketed to help BPH symptoms. I'll tell you in my own practice, I probably don't highly recommend any specific complementary and alternative medicines, largely because 
the research that I can see hasn't been super conclusive that those really work for every guy. But I will tell you that I have definitely some patients that will come to my clinic that really do believe that their medicines that they're on, either the alternative medicine or whatnot, does help their urinary symptoms, and I think that's fantastic. When, you know, if we do the behavioral things, we do the medications, and the men's symptoms are still pretty bad, or if they say, you know, gosh, I really don't tolerate the side effects of medicines, or I can't afford them, or I really just don't want to take a pill every day, there are more invasive treatments, and that's when we start to think about surgery. Mm -hmm. You know, the tried and true surgery treatments that we used to do for BPH was what's called the transurethral resection of the prostate, which is the TERP surgery. And that's a surgery done through the penis channel, no cuts on the skin, where you kind of core out the prostate tissue, uh, kind of like removing you know, uh, uh, the inside of a clogged pipe with like a rotor rooter. Um, versus what's called a suprapubic prostatectomy or simple prostatectomy, which is making an incision of the skin to remove the prostate, like removing the meat of an orange and leaving the skin or the shell of the peel of the orange. Yeah. And those are really great proven surgeries. Um, but since then, you know, we have actually had newer therapies. We've had things like the homium laser and nucleation of the prostate or the hole up surgery, which is a great surgery through the urethra channel, no incisions to core out uh, pretty large prostates. We have uh, surgeries that we can use a robot approach to remove the prostate. And those hopefully have lower bleeding risk and complications and healing risk. There are even less invasive therapies that are used for small prostates, something like uh, the urethral uh, lift surgery, which will hopefully open the prostate tissue, like opening the window blinds without actually physically removing tissue. Mm -hmm. You can use water energy, using convection energy to sort of evaporate or remove the tissue as well. And hopefully by doing that with less side effects and less morbidity, you can treat a lot of patients that have bothersome BPH. Are there, are there patients that, that have been diagnosed with it and maybe it's, it's just, it's not interrupting their life that much where you just say you hold off on treatment? Is there any benefit on just trying to live with some of the symptoms? Definitely. I think many men, you know, because BPH is sort of a spectrum of a disease, a sort of continuum where it starts off not very bad and some, and then can progress. I think many men sort of live with BPH symptoms and do really great and never have to do anything about it. You know, I think one caveat with that is, is many symptoms of BPH, because it's, again, part of the normal aging process, it happens slowly. So it's sort of months to years over many years. And what happens is, is we kind of get accustomed to whatever the symptom is. So if you were maybe getting up once or twice at night, getting up three to four times a night, doesn't become that big a deal, then when it comes to five or six times a night, maybe a little bit more bothersome, or vice versa during the day, maybe you're going, you know, was going four times a day, now you're going six times a day, you know, at some point, maybe it's a little bit more bothersome, maybe it's not. I think for gentlemen that aren't that bothered by it, I think it's, we definitely watch a lot of these patients, we say, yeah, you know, maybe even on exam, it feels like you have a really, really big prostate, but if you're not bothered by it, it's not causing you troubles, reasonable to watch it. On the other hand, there is a subset of guys that with BPH that it will progress. And the problem is, is if it progresses and you don't treat it, that can cause big problems down the road. Men with untreated BPH are at risk for recurrent urinary tract infections. They can develop bad bladder stones. And at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is, is you can really injure uh, long term the health of the bladder, the health of the kidneys uh, because of poorly controlled or bad PBH. And, the, you know, a big symptom of BPH would be at the end of the day, you stop urinating. You are doing well. And if you can't urinate, you know, either really suddenly or over time, that can be a big detriment to quality of life. Absolutely. Is there any other final thoughts you want to get out there on BPH? I mean, specific to maybe the treatment decision process. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. I think, you know, I'll tell you from a provider standpoint, I actually think it's a pretty exciting time uh, to be interested or to treat BPH disease. I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in the past, we really only had a couple medicines yeah. and a couple really proven surgeries that we would offer patients. And 
definitely it worked for some people, but there were a lot of side effects and troubles with it. I think what's nice now is that there are a lot of new medications or treatments that are being evaluated that really will try to address the whole spectrum of BPH. Yeah. So it's not just the people that can't urinate at all or the ones that are having the really super bad prostates. I think nowadays we can address really depending on your lifestyle. If you have mildly bothersome symptoms, but you really don't want to take medicines every day, there's something we can do about it. On the other hand, if you have really severe urinary troubles and you have a really, really big prostate, there are things that we can do about it. I think, you know, it really helps just to be evaluated if you're bothered by it. Uh, it helps to be evaluated at a urology clinic. And I think there are many things that we can do to try to make the symptoms better. Oh, well, I'll just have you say your name one more time so we can remember who we had on the program today. Sure. Davis Herbert Cassett, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association. For more information on today's topic and for all things urology health, visit urologyhealth.org.